here in uh, Swaledale. actually located at the small car park which is just off the Grinton to Leyburn Road and today we're going to be exploring this beautiful part of the world but particularly Grinton Smelt Mill which is a, a very interesting and well preserved site. Um, we're just looking at the view from the car parking area and we actually have with us today uh, Robert White. Hello Robert. Robert's uh, one of our senior archaeologists at the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority uh, and he's basically going to take us on a little tour of this site. So from the car park we'll take this road and I'm just wondering as we walk up this track, Robert, whether you could uh, place Grinton Lead Smelt Mill in its context in this area. It's actually probably the best preserved smelting mill in the Yorkshire Dales, if not in the country. of the lead industry which goes back probably to Roman times, although we can't prove that, but which was a very major industry in the Yorkshire Dales in the 16th to the 19th centuries. And is that all over the Yorkshire Dales or just this particular in part? different parts of the Dales. Lead mining could obviously only take place where the lead veins were found. Uh, that's very much concentrated in Swaledale and Narf and Garthdale and Lower Walkdale. There are other places as well, parts of Wensleydale, parts of Mallandale even. Of course, and Wharfdale too. And Wharfdale, yeah. Excellent. And what makes this particular rock that we can see lumps of lying around particularly good for lead? Uh, well, what we're seeing is actually just carboniferous limestone and sandstone, but the lead veins were... This, that, that, this rock was laid down some 300, 300 million years ago lead veins are much younger. They, they were inserted through almost like volcanic activity. Okay. Uh, technically speaking, it's not volcanic activity, but they're a hot saline salts in forced up towards the surface and they solidified and formed the lead veins which were exploited by the miners. Right, because limestone of course has sort of cracks in it, doesn't it? It's particularly sort of brittle rock that cracks. Well, it's, it's partly that, but it was mainly inserted through geological faults. Okay. Uh, although sometimes yes, it did spread out into other openings which have been formed for whatever reason. Okay. Right, so we've got a nice well-made track here and this presumably would have been the original access track to the smelt mill. Uh, there's two or three tracks to it. This is the one which has been maintained but it's also been maintained because it's the moors have as well as been the area where the lead was mined. They also have other functions. They're an agricultural resource, and increasingly these days they're a resource for the shooting industry. So this track is actually maintained for shooting purposes rather than for access to the lead industry. Okay, so we've got this lovely heather moor and around us, which is where shooting takes place and brags in the late summer. Very beautiful. We're lucky to have a fairly sunny day today <laughs> to do our exploring. It will vary. <laughs> We just walked on from that last stopping point, and up ahead of us, you can actually begin to see the first building on the site, and the second smaller one next to it. And this is perhaps why this site is the most interesting in the Dales, Robert, because it retains its roof structure. These two buildings retain roofs. Most of our smelt mills are ruined. This one survives, or they both survive, because it had an agricultural use in the early 20th century. Okay. So gathering pen outside the pizza store, and the smelt mill itself was used in the sheep dip. Right, sheep of course being one of those um, agricultural uh, necessities of this very wild landscape. Okay, so what's the, build, the first building that we're seeing now with the arches? The building with the arches, that's the pizza store. The smelt mill, we, we call it a mill because it used water power, but basically it housed furnaces. They need required fuel. So like in Ireland today, where people burn peat on their house fires. Yeah. Peat was used as, as domestic fuel, but it had a, a lot, there was a lot of it ex 
exploited in the 18th and 19th century for industrial purposes in the Yorkshire Dales. Peat was very much cut from the surrounding moorland. Sometimes we can still see exactly where, where the peat cuttings were. Others, they've removed all the peat and just gone down to the previous land surface. Right, because of course, as you can see, the, there's no trees in this landscape virtually. So that would have really been the only fuel for miles around. So coal. Not really. There are actually coal mines okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Coal was used for uh, smelting, but in in a different type of furnaces. The impurities which came from burning coal directly tended to interfere with the lead smelting. Ah. So some coal was converted to coke for smelting purposes, but. So the building had these open arches because... This is an open-sided building, or rather open-sided on one side with these large arches. Uh, usable, used for loading the peat and keeping, keeping, getting the airflow through it. There were small window openings or small ventilation slots in the far side of the building. But this one's very unusual, I think, in that one side of the peat store is is the same as the flue, the chimney which took the poisonous gases away from the smelt mill. And, this and that would this have been warm, of and that course. would have been a little bit of drying. Right, so, I mean, today we're lucky enough to have a nice, bright, dry day, but it can be very wet, especially over the winter time, so a perfect place to store the peat to keep it dry. And as you say, this flue from the smelt mill, which we're looking at here now, we're just above it, almost at roof level. Uh, the flue ran from that past this peat store and then up on the hillside. Ah, yes, and there we can actually see the remains of the flue. Should we just walk on and just have a quick look up so we see? And this flue ran up the hillside to what? It ran up the hillside for several hundred yards to a small squat chimney, of which now only the foundations remain. Right. And, and why, why did they have these long flues then? Well, process uh, creates some quite nasty gases uh, which weren't that good for the smelter's health. So early smelt mills had short vertical chimneys, right. often directly built on part of the mill, but that could suffer from blowback right. depending if the wind changed. So they gradually extended and created longer flues. They also discovered that a lot of the lead was volatilised, essentially to a gas form, and as that cooled along these long flues, it settled on the sides of them, and by periodically going up and down and scraping the sides of the flue, they could increase their production by perhaps as much as 20%. Right, and this, this is called fume, wasn't it, this gas that went fume, up the flue, yes. yes, okay. And it's a pretty horrible job, I can imagine, scraping it off the sides of these things. Not the most pleasant. <laughs> uh, the Grinchard flue has a series of access chambers you were never that far from an opening into the, the flue. Now it's heavily collapsed and the, it's only partially surviving. But originally there were some eight access chambers into the side of the flue. Mm. Did, they, did they run water down it to wash it out? Some in so on some smelt mill flues there's very clear evidence for water being used to flush the flue after the sides have been scraped down, but not a Grinton. Mm. There's no water supply which is frequently traced, which is of a water supply down that would have run down this chimney. There's no evidence for a water supply down this flue, and equally there's no evidence for water reflected at the bottom of it, because if you do have water running down, picking up lead fume, you then need some reflect to settle out, and there are no settling ponds in Grinton. Okay. Right, so that's the flue as it runs up the hillside, and if we just slowly turn around now, we're essentially standing on top of part of the flue here. As we can see, as Robert said, it's running up the side of this peat store. So shall we walk round and have a look at the smelt mill? And there 
there we can see these uh, blocked up um, sort of air vents inside of the they're heat store. They're a little bit more than air vents. You can right. see the timber lint above them. Right. Originally they were quite large windows. Right. Uh, I don't think though that they were used for loading because the crew would have been in the way. Of course. It would have been very easy to load from inside. It's much easier to load through the large cart entrances on the other side. Okay. These have now been blocked. Fascinating. Buildings like this are always have fascinating stories to tell, don't they? They really do. This one's got a quite a conservation history. Uh, the building was sliding both towards us and downhill. Part of the work of the National Park Authority was to restore the structure and ensure that it didn't collapse. There's a series of hidden buttresses which have their bases this side sunken into the roof and we inserted a steel ring beam around the head of the wall and a series of new breaking trusses to prevent oh the building sliding, sliding into <laughs> the screen effectively. It's a lot of work isn't it and of course we can't do that with every structure in the Orchard House but this is obviously one that was in pretty good condition to begin with so it was thought worth doing. Yes it's a recognised building of special architectural and historic interest, it's a listed building, it's also a scheduled monument and interpreted for the public. Yes, it's a very, very useful place to come and visit and being well looked after, I'm pleased to say. So the line of the flue, you can actually see the difference in the colour of the stone, can't you? And where the flue was actually built into the side of the uh, peat store by those stones that are sticking out in that a line. That was the top of the flue. Yeah. Clearly it's the building's been altered and had a later buttress put in at that end and a more recent buttress put in at this end to help prevent it falling mm, over. Mm. That was work which had been done before we intervened. Right, okay. Excellent. Okay, so this is another good pan up the hillside. As we said, there would have been a little chimney at the top, but that's now gone. If you do explore up there, just be careful not to actually walk on top of the flue because, as you can see, those arches are quite thin and fragile, and we don't want them being damaged any further. Okay. Let's continue on down and have a look at the smelt mill. So if we stop here, and perhaps Robert can tell us what we're looking at. We're looking at what is the last smelt mill on this site. Uh, we know there was a smelt mill here in the early 18th century, documented in 1722. A smelt mill's first shown on a map of 1768 but it's possible that the building we see in front of us is largely one which was either totally built or rebuilt in the 1820s. As we know that the, the mill that was here was out of production between 1820 and 1822, and then there's documentary references to a newly built smelt mill. But it's unclear as to how much, whether there is an original building here, or whether what we see is totally of the century. I think it's mainly a building of the early 19th century. And where would the mines have been then that supplied the ore that would have been smelted? They're mainly on the hillside to the south of us. We can actually see a large spoil heap from one mine, about 500, 600 metres to the south. That orange rock is, is the spoil from driving a level into the hillside to intersect the lake base. It's the one that's got the second white water um, container on that the farmer's left out for his sheep. Not sure why, we'd given the stream, but... Uh, Intermittent. Uh, the mill actually, well, up there the stream's intermittent. The mill sited here because there is a very strong spring source uh, just where the shooting track crosses the, crosses the stream. There's a little area which is fenced off into the mouth of the spring, ah. and that, that flows constantly throughout the year. Which but is quite unusual in limestone country, isn't it? Because often water disappears underground at times of drought. How much that has actually been modified by the mining activity, we don't know. It's quite possible that it's that underground it's been fed by drain by mines and it's been the water flows have been accentuated into it. Okay. So this landscape that we're looking at now, if we could sort of lift the layer of rock off underneath, we would see tunnels, and levels. We would see miles and miles of underground tunnel. Really? A lot of 
wood was used, wasn't it, to hold up the rock, which is now rotting. And it, it varied. Sometimes we had really strong rock surfaces where the lead vein was. Other times we're using wood to hold up the material which had been excavated. Miners were quite efficient in their working. They didn't want to bring material to the surface. If they could avoid it, they could leave it underground. Uh, so in areas where they had dug out a lot of rock, they'd taken the vein away, they would sometimes use those for storing or for backfilling with material which they were working on, where they were working the next vein. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of rock there which is quite loose and unstable. Mm. And at the same time, as they also dug deep holes, and those can be, well, they, you might, where there's water in the mine, you, you never know. Which is another reason why one should always stick to public rights of way on these uh, parts of the moorland because you never quite know what you've got. Some mine shafts have just got a few old railway sleepers over the top and they can be well rotted, so be very careful. The mountain rescue uh, are often called out to haul sheep up who've uh, gone down them uh, and uh, the occasional lost dog, which is why our dogs are on leads today. And, and uh, the shallow shaft. So let's come back and have a look at uh, this uh, building. And I've just noticed that uh, the top uh, right hand corner of the building, there's some remains of wood sticking out. What would that have been uh, for? Well, the furnaces are in the building on the left hand part of the building. And the right hand part of the building, if we look at it, was where there was the bellows which provided the blast of oxygen to get the furnaces up to the right temperature. And so And then this, this very large opening is obviously the beginning of the flume that we've just um, had a look at yes. right in the centre of the building. So that, that's running essentially out from above the hearths, up here, along this peat stall, through the arch and up the hillside. Okay. There was a, a bit of structure in front of us which is missing the 1891 map shows a rectangular building between us and the smelt. now make our way down um, let's see what there is to see in the mill okay, so we're just going to follow the course of the stream and this is a man-made channel is it that we're looking at yes yeah the, the stream has been controlled on this side there oh. is a very even gradient running down here with a pitch stone flag floor and the stream is controlled within these two side walls and that ensured that they had a larger working area around the mill and also that it didn't get flooded. Yeah. Okay, so we've just walked up the uh, stream and we're just looking back at the smelt mill and the peat store and the views of Fremington Edge beyond. And here we're almost at the point at which the water is bubbling out of the hillside. In fact, there it is. That's the, uh, the spring is just in that wooden fenced area behind, but here it's coming out of the ground to augment the stream that's coming down from further up, and that one would perhaps have dried up uh, in dry summers. 
Yeah. But it's a pretty good and steady water source. And there would have been a small reservoir, I believe, is that right, up on we're, the hillside? We're side? standing in the reservoir, one of the reservoirs, Ah, actually. yes, where the, see. Where these yes. rushes are, this is tilted up quite a lot, so there's an earth and stone bank running across the valley. Yeah. Oh, yes. So that would have augmented the natural supply of water by just building up a bit of a head of water, just in case they needed more. And it ensures that the water coming out of that spring comes up to the right level to get into the... Oh, water course, race, that water race. Yeah. And there is, in fact, an, another little reservoir up this side valley, but that's now largely dry, and that would have added a further water supply. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Right, so let's walk back down the site. And uh, what are these, build these little structures on the right here, Robert? ruins, that was a, a building which survived until the early 1970s. It had been, it's, it's marked on early maps as a smithy, but it's all, it's more than that. There's, there was a series of office buildings as well, and it's possible that it was also storage. Okay. There's, there's five bays of the building, of which only two, two bays survive with stonework. And there's also some evidence of another water wheel pit at this end. Oh yes. But what they were using water for there, I don't know. You wouldn't normally have used a water wheel pit, a water wheel to drive a, a, a blacksmith smithy. No. Of course the, the smith is incredibly important at a lead mining site because of the need to sharpen tools all the time. Sharpen tools and then maintain the machinery. Of course. Yes, if you imagine this huge water wheel inside this large structure. They would have taken quite a lot of looking after. In fact, on some sites they actually had somebody whose job was to look after pumps and water wheels, is that right? Yes, mm -hmm. Ebbing Guild was one was a house for the wheel master, effectively. Right. Okay. okay, so we're now approaching the smelt mill entrance, which is very well preserved. Have we, has work been done on this building by us? We've done quite a lot of work on this building in the 1980s. If you look carefully at this space, you can see the top half, the pointing is much flusher. We, we had the top bit repointed, but there was no need then to work on the lower half of the building. That's the original pointing still surviving. Okay. We've also had the slate roof replaced. Yes, very important, keeping the building watertight, and that's why it survived so well. Okay, let's go inside. It's obviously being used by sheep, so be aware it's quite smelly. Okay, quite a magnificent structure. So we're looking at where the ore halves we're were? We're looking at where the, the halves were. There was one in that bay, one in the middle, and one at the far end. The far end was actually a slag half, and, but that bit's been rebuilt and it's much harder to opening in the middle was when, with the concrete around it, is when the building was reused as a, as a sheep dip in the early 20th century, in the 1920s and 1930s. Okay. And in this building um, you'll spot, um, we have a couple of interpretation panels which have very good reconstruction um, paintings essentially of what the landscape would have looked like and what the building would have looked like inside. So I recommend that when you visit the site come and give those a good look over. But we'll continue our tour. One of the really impressive things about this building are, are the roof timbers across it. This single timber some 53 feet long. Amazing. That's not a local timber. No. It's almost certainly come in from Scandinavia, most possibly North America, and would have been dragged here on horses in the 1820s. Wow. You can imagine the amount of work <laughs> which went into <laughs> bringing that Absolutely. We have little idea of how difficult it would have been to transport heavy material from those days, which is why most of the lead was carried out on horseback rather than wagons, presumably, even quite late on, because horses have very nimble feet and don't get stuck in the mud like wagons do. Oh, 
remarkable. And in fact, there appear to be some um, carpenters' marks. Are those those crosses that yeah. we can see? Yeah. Make sure that so it was set, built off site, brought in bits, and then assembled like a kit. It's been uh, magnificent. Okay. And up above there, we can just see the daylight, and that's where the flu left the building. And we can't see the hoods, presumably, because they've all gone. Or can we? Incredibly hot, obviously. The <laughs> would have been working here. Yeah. Not the most pleasant of jobs, no. but perhaps better than working underground. At least you were warm and dry. <laughs> yeah. Too warm. Too yes, in the summer, perhaps. And then that's where the flu, the, the, the fume, fume yes. goes, goes out through that archway. And you can almost see some. Is that uh, soot left, or uh, is that no? Just that's that's sheet dropping. Oh, right, the okay. Same thing as sort of covers most of this floor. Right. Okay. Um, fairly rapid build up of sheet droppings in here. Yeah. And Timber work, so what's this timber for the remains of? Were they made of leather? Us the bellows would largely have been made of leather, oh yes. Goodness. Wood and leather. Holy wood, shit. leather and metal. Right. And iron. You must have been incredibly noisy in here. I can imagine. It wouldn't have been necessarily that noisy. Right. There would have been a constant background noise of mm. wheel turning and creaking. Right. Okay. And then a fairly slow noise, I think, from bellows ah, going up right. and down. Okay. Uh, no banging and crashing as such. Right. <laughs> and then needed the wheel right to come and yes, yes, the chap on site. And that's an even more enormous timber, isn't it, supporting this structure here. It's absolutely huge. And of course all this ironwork made by local smiths as well. So you can see remnants of and this giant arch here that we're looking at supported the flute, presumably. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's quite a remarkable structure. You have no idea from the outside what it's like inside. Really, really worth observing. No other um, smelt mill in the Dales has anything like this inside now. Certainly, no timbers inside. Uh, bits of archways, sometimes a little bit more than smelting hearth, but generally, that if there is a smelting hearth or hearth there, that's largely covered in rubble, so you can't see it anymore. Okay. It did make it quite hard to determine when what the building really looked like inside when we were trying to create that reconstruction drawing. Lots of ideas went into that, and there's a, a time that peaceful bit of smoke to obscure <laughs> where we weren't quite sure of the details. <laughs> yeah, so nobody ever completely agrees with these things. So, as we always say with these things, it's just a, an idea of what it might have looked like because the miners who worked these mills are long, long dead. So, when did the industry begin to die? Here? When would um, this mill have stopped? This mill was refurbished actually quite late. This mill was refurbished in the 1880s. But the company which refurbished it didn't last very long. Mm. I think the, the last smelt here was in, the, in about 1891. Which is quite late on in the lead industry, isn't it, yeah. in the Dales? Yeah, okay. But because the building was refurbished, that might also explain why it is in such good condition. Mm. Yes. But we don't know how much refurbishment took place and how much is the original build of 1820. Mm. Uh, there's occasionally references to how much they spent, but no drawings as to what was actually called work really took place and no detailed specifications of what work took place. No. To understand it we have to use the archaeological evidence, the evidence of the building as we see it. Yes. Okay. Well that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much Robert.